These days, Jonathan, on his website, describes himself as part advising, part campaigning, part writing, broadcasting, lecturing, giving talks. From 2000 to 2009, he was chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission until, in his words, the coalition government idiotically decided to get rid of it, which he says demonstrated vacuous commitment to being the greenest government ever. He's also the co-founder of Forum for the Future, the leading sustainable development charity, and co-director of the Prince of Wales Business and Sustainability Programme. Former director of Friends of the Earth, former co-chair of the Green Party and still a member, and in 2000 was awarded a CBE Services to Environmental Protection. Well, it's a fantastic CV, isn't it? For me, I've admired Jonathan's work since reading Seeing Green, around 1985, I think it was, when I worked for CAFOD and we were trying to develop the links between development and environment. Very inspirational, particularly the sections on growth. Big discussions in CAFOD leading on from that. But the last time I saw Jonathan, he was walking in the wave, along with many of us, the grassroots, in December 2010. So he's very much one of us. And he's been a patron of Kel almost since the beginning, if not from the beginning, none of us can quite remember. So we're very honoured to have you with us, Jonathan, and you invite to come to the lectern and speak to us. <laughs> Well, Ellen, thank you very much indeed. I, I can assure you I am really delighted to be here today. I don't think it really matters how long I've been a patron. It is a long time, and it has been an important part of my life as a sustainability activist throughout that time. So I feel quite privileged to be here today. I suppose all of us find our communities where we can. Sometimes they're local, made up of people who share experiences with us in the place where we live, or where we worship, or where we work. <laughs> Sometimes those communities are much more distant. They're communities of interest, shared interest, of purpose, of celebration, of protest, which still unfortunately remains a pretty critical part of the work that we have to do today. And I know that Paul wants us to come back and think about that the role of protest in the world today as part of our wider discussion uh, after our talks. For me, all of those communities have actually been the thing that made it possible to go on doing this work for more than 40 years. Because if you really go back to 1982, when CL started, or you go back to 1972, when I first started getting involved in green issues, and you just track the pattern of destruction and dereliction and abandonment of everything that humankind really should be standing for in this world, it is not difficult to get depressed. It is not difficult. So I don't know any activists in my world who don't need to have a deep source of inspiration and hope and meaning and purpose that they can draw on constantly in the work that they do to nurture them, to help them withstand some of that constant barrage of what we learn about the state of the world and the trouble that our world is in. So for me, the spiritual side of this, the community of spiritual practice and reflection, has been an important part of the way I've been able to do my own advocacy work, and it still is. So I want to thank all of my colleagues in CL for the inspiration you've given me over the years. You may not know I was kind of drawing on that as a source of inspiration, but it's been very important to me. Not necessarily quite as important to all of my colleagues throughout my working life. And I have often found myself in organizations which were a little bit more resistant to what I've described as the spiritual dimension. And the latest version of this, which I was reminded of by virtue of the title that we're talking about today, namely Spiritual Capital and Sustainability. When I wrote a book really on behalf of Forum for the Future about capitalism and the future of capitalism, 
and we had a big debate inside the forum about whether we should have a separate chapter on spiritual capital. Now, for many people, the concept of spiritual capital is kind of just a little bit too difficult. A concept too far. We're used to financial capital, we're used to the idea of manufactured capital, the things that we use, the products, the manufactured infrastructure, all of these things. We're getting used to natural capital as an idea, and obviously I'll come back and talk about that. And then people talk about social capital, what it is, the bonds that tie communities and society together, and of course the concept of human capital, often used in companies to explain the genius that each employee contributes to the success of that company. All of these things, the five capitals, natural, manufactured, financial, social, and human, sort of people go along. Spiritual capital, that's much harder. And when I suggested that we should have a chapter with the heading spiritual capital, there was the closest thing to an insurrection <laughs> that you could imagine in such a well-behaved and tolerant organization as Forum for the Future. This was an insurrection mostly carried out by email, I have to say, but it was there. And there were a lot of people who said, this isn't easy. Talking about capitalism is quite difficult. Talking about different stocks of capital gets us into some pretty contested territory. Talking about spiritual capital is just a bridge too far. So I just didn't have a separate chapter. <laughs> I just wove in all the stuff I would put about spiritual capital into different chapters in the book. That's the benefit of 40 years of campaigning. You learn how to adapt to circumstances and do what you thought you ought to be doing anyway, but just do it by different means. And actually, for me, spiritual capital is still a difficult concept. So one of the books that I think is very relevant to this is a book called Spiritual Capital, Wealth We Can Live By, which is the whole thrust of what we're talking about today, with two very good uh, writers here, a husband and wife team, Dana Zohar and Ian Marshall, who I've actually heard talk when I was on a visit to America. And I'm just going to, to make sure that we don't lose touch with something of our topic today. I'm just going to read you their definition of what they mean by spiritual capital. We call spiritual capital as the capital earned from serving deep meaning in society, discovering that purpose, exploring fundamental human values. It's the kind of capital measured not in dollars and cents, but rather in the achievement and the service that we can give on behalf of other people. It is the same kind of capital from a business perspective earned by the great Quaker businesses, like Clark Shoes and Roundtree's Chocolates, who use large proportions of their profits to ensure safer working conditions for their employees to build schools, hospitals, and so on. It's the same kind of capital earned by Islamic bankers, who refuse to charge interest for the money that they loan, but instead share the risk with their borrowers to create different enterprises. Probably so far so good with everybody here today. Now I'm going to challenge you a bit. These are their words, not mine. And it's the same kind of capital earned by Coca-Cola <laughs> when it offers the Indian government free use of its delivery trucks to distribute polio vaccine to the poor in isolated regions of the country. So, <laughs> see. We are likely to have a little bit of argy-bargy about what we mean by spiritual capital. Because I could go with all of that. I love the heritage of Quaker wealth creators in this country and elsewhere. One of the favorite companies that we work with today in Forum for the Future is Unilever, which still acknowledges and celebrates that culture. It's still part of the fabric of that company. I love the idea. The Islamic banking system being rather more fit for purpose in the world today than our own banking system. And I don't think I need to say anything more about that. But the idea of Coca-Cola 
as a creator of spiritual capital, kind of sticks in my throat. <laughs> that's the bit where I begin to think, come on, guys, if that's the inclusive definition we're working to here, we're probably in some kind of trouble. And I suspect that may well be the case that lies behind what I still see today as the relative ineffectiveness of many of the social movements of which I suspect you are all a part and which seek to change the nature of wealth creation, the nature of the economy today uh, in such an important way. <clears throat> We're very good at analysis. We know what is going wrong out there, but we find it quite difficult to bind people together in a different sense of purpose to change that as profoundly as it needs to be changed. So why <clears throat> Should we bother about looking at this through a spiritual perspective? We've got plenty of scientific, <coughs> technological evidence about the state of the earth and what we're doing to it. We're not short of good, humanitarian, humanist, secular solutions to the world's problems today. Most of the good people with whom I share this world of sustainability, activism, come from that tradition. Most of them come from the humanist tradition, the secular tradition, the tradition of empirical rationalism. Just look at the state of the world today, gather the evidence we need about the state of the world and the consequences of continuing to misuse the world in that way, and use that to change the opinions and then the policies of the politicians on whom we depend. It's a classic route to rational decision making in society today. Now, with the best one in the world, you've got to be massively optimistic to assume that that route to transformation is the one that is going to get us to a process of change fast enough to make a difference. You've got to be a massive optimist. This morning is absolutely not the time to go into a great, long diatribe about what it is that we're doing wrong in the world today, because otherwise we spend all the time doing that. But very simply stated, you all know what's happening today, which is we are caught up in a growth spiral <laughs> from which there seems to be no politically acceptable exit. So we're roughly 7 billion today. We're heading towards 9 billion by 2050. 1 billion people today are relatively rich. Another 1 billion are doing okay. The rest are still living often in conditions of considerable poverty. But every single person on this planet would like to be living like the rich people. And politicians see their principal purpose as making that possible. <coughs> That's the situation. Let's not dwell too much on that. It's the situation. That's what we're trying to wrestle with in our minds and our actions and our lives today. How do we do this intelligently, humanely, purposefully, quickly? Because quickly is important. So before I come back to the spiritual side of it, let's just cheer you up a bit. Um, I'm doing quite a bit of the work at the moment on new technology and the contribution that new technology will make to creating a sustainable world for 9 billion people by 2050. And actually, I've been doing this for about a year now. I am so much happier now than I was a year ago. Just looking at the speed of change in some of these different areas of the economy, some of the technologies coming through on energy, transport, food production, waste, infrastructure, building materials, the whole host of the big <laughs> underpinning sectors of the economy that make our lives possible. When I look at the innovation pipeline, as they call it, and I watch this stuff coming now to market, I'm thinking, whoa, that is amazing. That is amazing. 